What's up, church? We're so excited to have you guys tonight. If you're not already standing, let's go ahead, stand up, and let's worship Jesus together. You have come, and we have found life everlasting. Now alive to know your freedom, never. Just 
to sing this out. Your name is Victory. Your name, your name is Victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name, your name is Victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Resurrecting me 
Well, hey, man, at church, so good to see every single one of you here today. You guys having a good time so far? Listen, I want to give a particularly special welcome to any of you who are with us for the first time. We are really super pumped that you are here, and we'd love to get to know you, but we want to do that in kind of a low-risk way. So here's how we get to know you. There's a gift, or there's a um, card on the seat in front of you, on the seat back in front of you. If you pull that card out, it's called a guest card. If you go ahead and start filling that out, even while I'm talking, uh, we can start to get to know your name. And I'll tell you how. In a minute, we're going to take up an offering. And that offering is not for you. That's for our members, for people who come here regularly. Uh, we don't want you to put anything in financially. But when that offering plate comes by, if you'll drop out that filled guest card in, uh, maybe we can get to know you a little bit. Also, in that seat back in front of you, there's another card. It's called uh, the First Impressions card. That card, you can fill some stuff out, tell us a little bit about the service. But most importantly, as you leave today, we'd love to exchange that card for a free gift. Just our way of saying thank you for being a part of the service. Also, if you're watching online, shoot us an email, contact at manna.church, and let us know your name so we can get to know you as well. So whether you're watching online or you're here in the service, can we give all of our guests a round of applause, a welcome. 
You know, one of the things that we do at Mana Church are small groups. We love small groups. We love connecting in small groups. And so I want to encourage every single person, as we start this new year, if you have not gone through the growth track yet, why don't you make 2019, even January of 2019, the time that you start to do that? Connecting with God a little bit more in your faith. You do that in first step. Maybe connecting with the church, taking your next step of growth. You do that in next step. So you can go on the app. You can go on the web, but really, I hope that every single person that says, you know what, I'm a part of this church, you should join the small groups that are growth track. Now, speaking of small groups, if you happen to have been all the way through the growth track, you've completed leader step, then you are empowered to lead a small group. And now is the time where you can sign up to lead a small group. Maybe there's a book of the Bible you'd love to study and you'd love to lead that small group or an area in life that you're pretty good at. I like to run, so I lead a running small group. You know, I've discovered that some of the, the greatest places where I've grown in life is when I've decided to step out and lead a small group. So if you've been through Leader Step, I'd encourage you to do that. You can sign up on the web. Uh, you can register a group on the, uh, on, the, on the app as well. So if you've been through Leader Step, why don't you think about doing that right now? Well, I talked about the offering a moment ago. Now is the time to take up that offering, so I'm gonna invite our host team to come forward. As we do, we're cheerful givers here at Mana Church. That's right. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you've called us into your family and you've called us into your mission, Lord, and you allow us to be partners with you in your mission and mission as we pray as we share our story as we go but also lord through our giving so i pray that you would use what we give to multiply it to advance your kingdom here and to the ends of the earth in jesus name amen hey i'm chris when you came in today you found this card on your seat at all of our locations we're starting the year January 7th through the 27th with our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting is so important because it puts God first. It puts God in his rightful place. Fasting, when Jesus was asked, talk to us about following you, he said, first deny yourself, take up your cross, and then follow me. The first step of that, deny yourself, is what fasting goes right to the heart of. Fasting says, I wanna take an urge, I wanna take something that, that, that brings me life, and I wanna deny it for the sake of drawing close to God and hearing him through the act of prayer. Prayer is just simply talking to God. We've created a prayer card to help you begin that conversation. Just speak to him and let him speak back to you. I really think 2019 can be the best year, both in our lives as a local church, but also in our individual lives and in the lives of our family. And it just is the perfect way to start the year, to take 21 days at the beginning of the year and say, not us first, but you first, God. How you doing, 1230 crowd? Y'all doing good? Good to see you. I'm so excited about this 21 days of prayer and fasting. We're going to make it easy for you. You've got that little card on your seat. It's got the prayer points on there. You've got the Bible reading on the back. If you go to the web or you go to the, really any of our social media, but you go to our web, you go to our app, there's going to be a devotional every day starting tomorrow, two to three minutes, something right out of the reading just to help you get started. So it's really going to be a great time together. And I'm also excited about this brand new sermon series called Adulting. 
six characteristics of emotionally healthy people. If you've been here any period of time, you know we're all about helping you find your purpose and to walk in your calling. We want your marriages blessed, your relationships blessed. And I feel like there's a little slice that's more important than we've given credit to, and that's the emotional health side of our lives. And so we're going to talk about that during this series, and we'll kind of frame it here in the beginning. We'll jump into one of the characteristics, and it's going to be a great time. So did you know that you can be physically healthy, but not necessarily be emotionally healthy? Yeah, probably most that. of us know that, yep. yes. We all uh, know people whose lack of emotional health or emotional maturity affects the other relationships in their lives. And the truth be told, that's actually all of us at some point or in some areas in our lives. Now, did you know that you cannot be truly spiritually healthy? That is, in how you relate to the Lord and His Word and your other brothers and sisters in Christ. You cannot be spiritually healthy if you are not also emotionally healthy. And that's a big point. You need to say that again. Okay, or growing into emotional health. You cannot be truly spiritually healthy without also being emotionally healthy or growing in that area. Why do you think that is? Because some people all the time and all the people some of the time skip emotional health and just go directly into spirituality to find their significance and their belonging. So without also becoming emotionally healthy at the same time. So they think that being spiritual or, or spirituality, thinking, believing, acting in spiritual ways will override their emotional immaturity. Sadly, and, and, and I, I wish I could say this weren't true, but it, it really is. Sadly, many people don't even know that they have places in their lives of right. emotional immaturity. They're thinking right now, what are you even talking about? I'm right. fine, just like I am. Right. Especially when you mask it, your emotional immaturity, with spirituality. So let us be clear. Emotionally mature people recognize that there are areas still in their lives where they are still a little emotionally immature. And emotionally immature people don't see that, as Michael was just saying. They think they're fine just the way they are. If we're truly emotionally mature, emotionally healthy, then we know that there are places in our lives right now, and if I asked you, you could list it, where you have growth that needs to happen, where you need to mature emotionally. Um, if you can't tell me where you aren't emotionally healthy, then that is evidence that you aren't emotionally healthy. Mm. So we're going to put this... We're going to put this to the ultimate test. And we're going to say now, in front of all of us, Michael, would you please tell us the list in the areas serious? where you are not emo I Are you serious? No, are I'm you seriously kidding. doing this I'm right now? I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do would this. Would I do that to you? <laughs> what? <laughs> Somebody said yes. Man, y'all okay. don't know me. Wait, that's a bad Okay, one. but I'm just kidding. We'll talk about those later. Yeah, we will. <laughs> we sure will. So in places, I can't believe you almost dime me out. So in places where we're not emotionally healthy, we think that spirituality or doing spiritual things is going to help us cope, it's going to help us become accepted, it's going to give us the power to live, all while ignoring the broken places in our lives. So what some people will do, they'll recognize that, wow, this, my, my spirituality, my prayer, and Bible reading, all that kind of stuff is not over, overcoming some areas of my life. So what I'll do is I'll go get counseling or I'll go get healing. Now, I believe in counseling. We have some of the best counselors in the city on our, on our staff. Some of the best counselors in the city in our church attend here. Um, we believe in healing, emotional healing, physical healing, all that. But let me just say something. You can't pray somebody to maturity. Sometimes, in some places of our lives, we just have to grow up. As a matter of fact, there are times that the Lord uses the, the counseling and the emotional healing, etc., Healing has to take place, but from that place of healing, there's still just plain maturity, growth, growing up that needs to happen. So emotionally immature folks, which is all of us, unhealthy people emotionally, which is all of us, tend to compensate for our brokenness with spirituality, but this, our spirituality, when we do that, only serves to put people off. It doesn't seem as genuine. The good news is that we're all broken, okay? Hello? Look around. In fact, not, you know, not really. Not really you, but all the people on your row are jacked up. <laughs> okay? So the truth is that all of us are mostly immature or mostly unhealthy in some areas. The even better news is that we can move forward. And I'm really excited about this series for that reason. So a guy named Peter Scazzaro, 
He wrote a book, talked about, the, and in the book, it's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. He talks about four levels of emotional maturity. Now, just in case you think, oh, so you're going to teach the book, we are not. In fact, the only thing we're borrowing from, from Peter Scazzaro here are these four different levels of emotional maturity, which we're going to read to you in just a moment. Um, he, he went one way in the book, which is very helpful, but we're going a different direction. So don't go by the book thinking that you come next week and it's going to be what's in the book. Um, so let's just go over these four categories. Let's start with the emotional infant. Okay, so see if you identify yourself in any of these, in any of the characteristics of these four I'm levels. I'm going to just read it right out of his book. I look, the emotional infant says, I look for other people to take care of me emotionally and spiritually. I often have difficulty in describing and experiencing my feelings in healthy ways. And I rarely enter the emotional world of others. I... Consistent, I am consistently driven by a need for instant gratification, often using others as objects to meet my needs. People sometimes perceive me as inconsiderate or insensitive. I'm uncomfortable with silence and being alone. When trials, hardships, and difficulties come, I want to quit God and the Christian life. I sometimes experience God at church and when I'm with other Christians, but rarely when I'm at work or when I'm at home. So that's the emotional infant. Here's the emotional child. When life is going my way, I'm content. However, as soon as disappointment or stress enter the picture, I quickly unravel inside. I often take things personally, interpreting disagreements or criticism as a personal offense. When I don't get my way, I often complain. I throw an emotional tantrum, withdraw, manipulate, drag my feet, become sarcastic, or take revenge. I often end up living off the spirituality of other people because I'm so overloaded and distracted. My prayer life is primarily talking to God, telling him what to do and how to fix my problems. Prayer is a duty and not a delight. The third level is the emotional adolescent. I don't like it when others question me. I often make quick judgments and interpretations of, others, of people's behavior. I withhold forgiveness to those who sin against me, avoiding or cutting them off when they do something to hurt me. I subconsciously keep records of the love I give out. I have trouble really listening to another person's pain, disappointments, or needs without becoming preoccupied with myself. I sometimes find myself too busy to spend adequate time nourishing my own spiritual life. I attend church and I serve others, but I enjoy few of the delights of being in relationship with Christ. My Christian life is still primarily about doing for and not being with God. Prayer continues to be mostly me talking with little silence, solitude, or listening to God. And then finally, the level that we, we're all growing toward, an emotional adult. The emotional adult says, I respect and love others without having to change them or becoming judgmental. I value people for who they are and not for what they can give me or how they behave. I take responsibility for my own thoughts, my own feelings, my own goals, and my own actions. In other words, I don't blame what I do on others. I can state my own beliefs and values with those who disagree with me without becoming adversarial. I am able to accurately self-assess my limits, my strengths, my weaknesses, I am deeply convinced that I am absolutely loved by Christ. And as a result, I do not look to others to tell me I'm okay. Mm. I'm able to integrate both, so put together, both doing for God and being with God. So if you're honest, you're probably a little confused right now because you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, when you went through the emotional infant, I saw some of myself there. When you went through the emotional child, I saw some of myself there. When you went through the emotional adolescent, I saw some of myself there. And thank God, I saw some of myself in the emotional adult. I mean, anybody with me on that? You say, yeah, at least part of me is okay. The rest of me is just, I, I don't know what, I, just electric shock. I don't know. Um, so that, that, that actually is, that, 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 that's universal because none of us mature evenly. So in some places we mature better than we do in other places. So we're going to be staggered in our growth, and we're going to need to address some of these different areas. But we can't just use our, our spirituality to compensate for those areas. Um, 
And what do I mean by that, our spirituality? My knowledge of God and how, how much you know God and what you know of the Bible and all the theology that you got inside your head that you know how to worship and you know how to pray and maybe you know about spiritual warfare. Maybe you serve and you give and you're generous and you, you know your spiritual gifts and those kinds of things. We can't just always go through life trying to use those tools to compensate for other places when we're broken. Our spirituality is important. God wants us to be spirit, as you'll see in a moment, wants us to be deeply spiritual people. It's just that in order for that, in order for that spirituality to be effective and to be believable, we have to be growing also in our emotional maturity at the same time. So Michael and I have known someone in our lives. Um, we're really close to them. They are, they are brilliant. They're educated, very, very competent in what they do, and they are completely friendless and they have no clue that they are the ones that put people or uh, they keep people at arm's length, length, but inadvertently. They don't realize, actually, they struggle in the area we're gonna address today in um, self-awareness. They have no self-awareness and when they interact with people, they don't realize they're putting them off. Therefore, they, they'll comment on, well, I had, this, I had this friendship and then they just stopped calling me and, I mean, it's just really, really sad. It has nothing to do with their age, obviously has nothing to do with their intelligence. And every broken and hostile relationship is somebody else's fault. It's sad. So here's what we did. We looked at all the different lists out there of characteristics of emotionally healthy people, from Christian psychologists and Christian scholars and Bible scholars and, and secular psychiatrists and all those different kinds of things. And then we cross-referenced them. So what is everybody saying that's in common? We found six key characteristics, and they are these. Self-awareness, which we'll talk about today. Then faith, flexibility, self-control, forgiveness, generosity. Some of these we're going to interpret in a way different than, like for instance, next week on faith is not what you're expecting. So these are places where we can grow. These are places where we can develop. And so we're going to focus on these. We're not going to focus on the things we can't change like how old we are, or whether we're male or female, what gender we are, or how tall or short, or all the, all the um, Unchangeable. unchangeables in our lives. For instance, we're not going to talk about what this lady was dealing with. So there's a woman who, who took after her father in the sense that she had a very large nose. I mean, like a schnoz. I mean, it was a big, it was a big nose, just like her father. And so, you know, she, anyway, one morning, she, after a night of tossing and turning, she finally woke up and sat on the edge of the bed, just so forlorn. And her husband said, baby, what's wrong? She said, I just can't sleep. My nose is so stuffed up. And he lovingly got out of bed and said, it's okay. I'll go get the plunger. <laughs> wow. That joke was so, Laura, why did you put that joke in this message like that? <sighs> terrible. So let's start with self-awareness and work on your jokes, baby. Self-aware people know their weaknesses. <laughs> Being finding good jokes. A self-aware person may know that they... These people love my jokes. Yes. A brother could use a little help right now. <laughs> At least the guys stick with me. At least. No? I'm on my own? Sorry, dear. This is, this is just, this is, a, this is a group, this is a group therapy session. <laughs> I'm sorry, we'll move on. <clears throat> we'll start with self-awareness. Yes, Let's self -aware. describe it. Well, self-aware people, seriously now, self-aware people know their weaknesses and are learning how to offset them. What do we mean by that? So just as an example, somebody decides that they, they, they want to commit to becoming more self-aware. And so they realize that they have a tendency to dominate conversation. Um, somebody has brought that to light or they just have become aware that when they're with a group of people, they end up being the only one talking because they just don't let other people have something to say. So they, they commit, they realize, Ooh, that's a weakness. So I'm going to purposefully choose to be quiet so that other people can have their say and can have input. A self-aware person is aware of how the pain from the past can and sometimes does affect their present relationships. Self-aware people are free from the labels of the past, the limitations, the restrictions, the judgments that others have placed upon them. A self-aware person is, is comfortable with themselves. They are, you've heard this phrase before, they're comfortable in their own skins. They're comfortable with who God has made them to be and called them to be. They're generally free from comparison with others because they understand that comparison 
is not profitable. There's no nothing. It is. It only leads in a negative direction. And so because they've experienced it, they know how to go to the Lord and to get help when they're compar comparing themselves to others. A self-aware person is comfortable in quiet. They're comfortable being alone. They're also comfortable in a crowd. I want to just grab one word for you that maybe will help um, you think about what it means to be self-aware, and that's the word circumspect. Circumspect comes from two Latin words, circum, meaning around, and the second Latin word, spesere, which means... Spesere. Spesere sounds like, sounds like spaghetti, manicotti, spaghetti, <laughs> spaghetti. Spesere. Spesere. Yeah. Thank I you. Can do it too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that deep insight and input. <laughs> Circum meaning around. Spacete, which is where we get the word spectacles, which means to look. So a self-aware person, instead of just looking at right, what's right in front of them or looking at themselves and they are they have their heads up. They are circumspect. They are looking around at Yes, themselves, but themselves in relation to others. They're looking at others and how they interface with others. I, I like that. I like that word because it relates not only to self-awareness, yes. but awareness of the surroundings and the awareness of the people and what's going on with yes. them who are in the surroundings. Yes, and just as, an, just as an example, we've probably all been to the grocery store maybe at a really busy time, and there is that person that you run into on one of the aisles that is not, does not have... Um, they're not being circumspect, and they're right in the middle of the aisle, the and they're middle. just they're just slowly you can't get walk, them. You, you can't you can't. They're not back. Even walking; they're just shuffling. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? And it's like you, yeah, mm, mm, uh -huh. hello. Go ahead. Yes, this is obviously aware a lack of self awareness that Michael. Okay, feels. I lack patience in driving, in traffic. The grocery store is indoor traffic. You know what I'm saying? Am I right? Am I right? Why do they make those aisles so narrow? You barely get two carts and then one person just kind of... But do you know that person is, uh, is, is often not doing it on purpose? They're, they're actually not trying to get in our ways. They just are lacking any kind of self-awareness. That's why you should probably just gently bump them with your cart. <laughs> just a little nudge. Just, oh, and they go, oh, excuse me. And they go, oh, am I in your way? Hello, what do you think? Look at the line behind me. Are you serious? I'm sorry. I repent, sweetie. Thank you. I do. Okay, so let's not be the person in the grocery cart, especially if Michael's shopping that day. <laughs> Wear on your back, church member, don't bump me, and I won't. I'm sorry. I really am. I really do apologize for that. I'm going to be stick to the notes. Self-awareness. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't help it. She set me up for those. Can you not see that? Can you see that? Anybody see that? Yes, she set me up. Wait, 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 wait. Where is the emotional so, adolescent that blames so self others? Self-awareness. <laughs> self-awareness. Seriously now, this is important. I'm going to go to something really serious, okay? Don't read that other stuff just now. Okay. All right. Self-awareness, for real. I, I, I probably shouldn't tell you this. But of the six, because you might not come back. But uh, seriously, because of the six characteristics, self-awareness is by far the most important. And I did not realize that as we got into the study. But, but as I dug into it, I, I came across, for instance, an article that's, that cited self-awareness as the most important capability for leaders to develop. It was written, it was, is entitled, How to Become a Better Leader. It was published in the MIT Sloan Management Review. It was a scientific, quali qualitative, and quantitative study that actually showed that self-awareness is the most important capability. And it, was, it was so important, it was re republished in Forbes magazine in February 15, 2018, just last year. But other studies show, and this is really the more important, other studies show that self-awareness can be the greatest indicator of success, the greatest predictor or indicator of success in your marriage, with your children, if you're self-aware in your marriage, you have a better marriage. If you're self-aware with your kids, your child rearing will be better. On your job, I mean, the greatest basketball players, think about it. They're aware. You look, you watch him play, and you go, how did he know that player was there? He has self-awareness on the court. I mean, it affects every area of life. It really is so important. That really is an excellent point. And just as we were, as we were preparing this, it just occurred to me, 
I don't know that they use this in report cards anymore, but when Michael and I were in school, you had the report card that, that demonstrated what your, that quarter, what you, you know, you made an A, B, or a C in, in math, in science, in English, whatever, literature on the left-hand side. Um, then on the other side, they had some interpersonal things that they graded. Now, when we were in school, you either got a U, unsatisfactory, or an S. And they were things like um, uh, talks too much. Guess who always got a U in talks too much? The second one I, was... I actually had times in my educational career where they literally moved my desk away from everybody else in the room. <laughs> Anybody else go through that? Yes, I love you people. Look at that. My tribe is here. I found other ways to communicate. Hey. Okay, another one of the things underneath the talks too much, there was plays well with others. I got S's in that all the time. I can see that you would have done that really well. But the truth is, being self-aware, seeing themselves in relation to others. I just thought that was interesting. That's very good. So I was in South Carolina, and a friend of mine was teaching, um, actually, on self-awareness. And uh, I was very interested because I knew we were going to be doing this series. And he had this really cool diagram, which I just completely stole. His name is Darren Patrick. Darren was at Seacoast Church in uh, Mount Pleasant, uh, basically uh, um, Charleston, South Carolina. And um, so he was teaching this. And he talked about, if you just take a look at the diagram on the screen, on, on the left-hand side is, is how you view yourself, what you think of yourself, your own particular um, self-awareness what you think, how you see yourself. And then on the far other end of the spectrum is how people experience you. And so if, if, if you see yourself one way, but we need to recognize, and, and people that don't have any self-awareness think, I'm fine. The way I see myself is perfect. If anybody disagrees with me, they're wrong. And, and there's the problem. So we tend to think of it, we see ourselves one way, we think that we're right about that, but then how people experience us may not be as we want them to. They, 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 may not, they may not see us as we see ourselves. And the gap between those two he called the SAG, the self-awareness gap. Here's the problem. The farther the, away that gap is, you don't seem believable. Right. You don't seem genuine. Right. Because they have an experience with you that doesn't jive with the way you see yourself. Right. And they know that. So, they, so it, it's hard to trust you. It's hard to believe you. It's hard to believe you're genuine. And since trust is the basis of every relationship, you can see how a lack of self-awareness impacts my relationships because the people around me don't trust me. They think I'm self-deceived. Right. So when I speak, they don't necessarily listen to me like I want them to. I may pick that up, react to them, further entrench myself in the way I see myself, and come to the conclusion something's wrong with them. So you draw all that? So what we need to do is reduce that sag, reduce that self-awareness gap, get the two closer together. After the first service, a lady came up to me and she had written down this little um, rhyme poem that her mother used to tell her. Oh, the gift that God would give us to see ourselves as others see us. Can I tell you a little quick story? Of course. I already told you. Can I tell, you think I should? I should, yes. So I also had... So this person was obviously fairly self-aware who came up and said, hey, I've been practicing this for years. My mom taught me this. But I had a, a guy come to me and say. Right after first service. Right after, right after first service. So while you're getting that, I was getting the other side. Okay. So he came to me and said, Pastor, I just want to let you know I really like your preaching. I really do like your preaching. I mean, sometimes I walk out. <laughs> I am not. Th this is a true story. Pastor, I really like your preaching. I really, really do like your preaching. I mean, sometimes I walk out. It's just because I get busy. Anyway, um, I've been coming to this church a couple of months. I really like it, and I'm, I'm glad to be here. I said, thank you. How, you know, first time you meet somebody, hey, right. hey, I really love it. I really hate it. I'm, I'm schizophrenic. Anyway, um, okay. not exactly the most self-aware interaction. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to look at this portion of Scripture really, really quickly, uh, found in Proverbs chapter 26. I'm going to read the first verse. Like snow in summer or rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. Now, I really wanted to unpack this portion of Scripture, but this is really not what we're talking about. But Michael is letting me <laughs> say one little thing. The word fool here is from the Hebrew word kasil, which can either be translated stupid or dull. Dull is in the sense of they can't take input. As we were kind of studying and 
oh man, I wish we could just camp right here and study. This is a really cool portion of scripture. But from that perspective of what, what the Hebrew is trying to say there, the, um, the fool either can't take input or won't take input because they think they're okay. So this is going to be very scathing on the, the Lord's opinion of a fool. Yeah. Beginning in uh, verse 3 now. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. In other words, a fool deserves to be beaten. Answer not a fool according to his, fo- according to his folly. bump into with the shopping cart, as the case may be. <laughs> Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Some translations say, answer a fool as his folly deserves. Correct. Also, a wise man knows when to answer a fool and when not to answer right. a fool. So, Right. Okay. Verse Sorry six. about that. Yes. Whoever sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts his own feet off and drinks violence. I wonder what that means. Like a lame man's legs, which hang useless is a proverb or a bit of wisdom in the mouth of fools. Like one who binds the stone in the sling. Okay, think slingshot. Why would you bind a stone in the sling? Like is one who gives honor to a fool. Like a thorn that goes into the hand of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of fools. Like an archer who wounds everyone is one who hires a passing fool or drunkard. Like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. That phrase, you see a man wise in his own eyes, that's a person who lacks self-awareness. So if we were reading this, saying the Michael Fletcher 21st century translation, it would say, do you see a man who is self, who, do you see a man who lacks self-awareness? There's more hope for a fool than for him. So as much as God had to say about how bad it is to be a fool, it's worse to lack self-awareness. Lacking self-awareness is more dangerous than being a fool. Let's continue this Bible study from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Let's go to the book of Romans, chapter 12. I think this is the quintessential passage in the Scripture dealing with the matter of self-awareness. So what Paul is trying to get us to do here in this passage is to take a sober self-evaluation based on how we are made by God to be, what our calling is, etc., so let me just begin in verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers by, brothers, by the mercy of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So now we're going back to spirituality for a moment, all right? So Paul says it's good to be spiritual. And by the way, what does it mean to, to give your body as a living sacrifice? It means to give your whole life to God. So he's saying, I want you to be spiritual in every area of your life. I want you to be fully devoted, fully committed to God, and walking in healthy spirituality. But watch watch how we get there. Watch the connection that he makes with spirituality to emotional health. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world. Now, another other translations, plural, use different phraseology in reference to this. Some say, do not let the world or others push you or force you into its mold. In other words, don't let people force you to try to become a person that God hadn't created you to be. Or do or believe things that God doesn't say are right in the Scripture. Yeah, exactly right. So that means you need to be secure. Why is that? Because insecurity is an aspect of emotional immaturity, and that's what motivates you to allow people to push you into a mold that God hasn't designed for you. So let me go back to the beginning of that verse. Do not be conformed to this world. First of all, I want you to be fully spiritual, but do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your spirit. Is that what it says? No. There are three parts to you, spirit, soul, and body. So what he says here, I want you to be fully spiritual, fully devoted to God in every area of your life, but in order to do that, I need you to be transformed in your soul, not in your spirit, in your soul. Spirit's great in your soul. In order for your spirituality to accomplish what I intend for it to do, your prayer, your worship, all that, you're going you're to have to grow in your own soul. So he says, and the soul is made up of mind, will, emotions. Basically what he's saying is you have to grow up. Commit yourself fully to God and grow up. Don't let people push you around. Be the person God called you to be. And well, how do I do that? By testing. 
By testing, it says here, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your life, being who God called you to be, doing what God called you to do, becoming self, in order to do that, you have to become self-aware. Who, who am I really? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Instead of trying to play my weaknesses all the time, foolishly talking myself into believing I'm actually strong there when I'm weak, I need to learn what that is. I need to put that thing aside. I need to learn what my strengths are. And that's what he's talking about here. Learn by testing what you're good at, what you're weak at. As Laura mentioned a little while ago, when to talk, when to be quiet, when to follow, when to lead. Verse 3. For by, for by the grace given to me, Paul's talking, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Don't have this puffed up view of yourself. In other words, he's, if, if Paul were here and Darren Patrick are here, they'd look at that diagram and say that's exactly what Paul's trying to say. Don't let there be this giant gap between how you see yourself and reality, which is how other people see you. You've got to shorten that gap. You want to become who God called you to be. If you want to be fully devoted to Christ in every area, you got to be who God called you to be by shortening that gap, by reducing that gap. Are you all with me? Okay, good. So he says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but how should I think then? Think with sober judgment. In other words, become self-aware. Each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned him. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. He said, be who you're called to be. Don't try to be somebody else. Why? Because everybody else is already taken. Verse 5, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Life is lived out in relation to others. And when we lack self-awareness, when the way we see ourselves, as Michael just said, the way we see ourselves does not line up with the way others see us or experience us, then they don't trust us. They don't believe in us. In fact, they are put off by us. So they distance themselves from us. Verse 6, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, those are the gifts, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes, that is to give in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. These are spiritual gifts given to us by God to find our fit in the body, socially, emotionally, and in a healthy manner, spiritually, in relationship with other people. I'm gonna make a statement, I'm gonna make it boldly, and some of you are gonna take issue with it. And so let me take a moment and let me kind of massage it into your understanding. God awareness and others awareness stems from self-awareness. I know you probably think, mm, all things originate with God, God reveals himself first to us, and then that is true. But watch this. Even in salvation, the law, God sends the Holy Spirit with the law to convict your heart of sin and you become self-aware of your sinfulness and your need for a Savior. Then, by grace, we reach for Jesus in the cross and we're born again. Is that how it happened? So in other words, you can't be born again until right. you have some measure of self-awareness that you're a sinner and need a Savior. Right. So yes, God moves first, but God sends the Holy Spirit to take the law to show us that we're sinners we acknowledge that, oh my gosh, I need a Savior. We reach for grace. Through grace, we touch Christ. We're forgiven. We're born again. So watch this. You have to know yourself. You have to know yourself as others know you, not just as you know yourself. See, there's the problem. We, I know me, and I'm happy with what I know of me, and I'm comfortable with my own problems. But if I want to grow in my relationship to God, if I want to grow in my relationship to others, if I, if I want my spirituality to do what God designed it to do and work for me, changing me from the inside out, I don't just need to know me as I know me. I need to know me as you know me. So I know where my gaps are. So I know where my broken parts are. That's good. So I know where I really do need to change. I need someone to love me enough to tell me. So what are we going to do about this? So how can we increase in our self-awareness? And let me just point out to you, we're not talking self-consciousness or self-absorption. The self-awareness is for the use of determining how we interact with others, okay? So it's not an absorption with self, it's us in relation to others. Mm. Does that make sense? Okay, so how can I increase my self-awareness? Since this is, this is a big issue, as Michael mentioned earlier. The number one indicator for success. Exactly. So number one, decide to become self-aware by God's grace. Decide to become self-aware. Choose to be circumspect. 
I think just the act of saying, I want to become self-aware, makes you aware that you need to be aware, and self-awareness has begun. So in humility, this will dramatically increase your self-awareness. Number two, listen to others. Listen to how they relate to you, what they say about you, how they respond to you. Watch for patterns. You'll need to embrace what you hear, even if you don't see it yet. Because if we're lacking in self-awareness, then we know there are places that we don't see fully. So number three, ask people that you trust. Ask people that you know love you for insight. Because they may have to say some things that are hurtful because we don't see them yet. So see the things that they're pointing out to us. We don't see those quite yet. So we want to we wanna ask and invite and listen to people who we trust. I want to share a verse with you that you already know. You've read many times before. It's in James chapter 1, verse 19. It, it says, my dear brothers, take note of this. And whenever the scripture says, take note of this, you should take note of this. It says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteous life that God desires. So what does that mean? It means, as Laura said, literally ask for insight. Keep your mouth shut and just listen. Don't react. It may hurt, but don't react. Don't defend because your reaction will only serve to further entrench you into the place where you are right now. And the other person perceives the reaction knows now that he or she should not have believed you. There's the sag again, because you really aren't interested in hearing. You really just wanted confirmation. So we gotta be genuine. I know that sounds like a tough word, but I didn't write it. The Holy Spirit told James to write it, and it's in the book. Number four, take a test. You know, earlier we read where Paul said, test to see. And he gave us a couple of spiritual gifts that we could measure ourselves against. But you know, today we have all kinds of tests. So if you have the notes, if you don't pick them up on the way, get them on the way out, or, or you can log on to the website and the notes will be there. Um, take an Enneagram test. Have you ever heard of the Enneagram? If you haven't, don't worry, just Google it. It's a test that'll help you. Um, take the DISC test or the Myers-Briggs test or a spiritual gifts test. Seriously, these are all free. You can find them online. They take 10, 15 minutes a piece. They're hard to argue with. Um, they'll show you where you're strong and where you're weak and how people react to you. And you're going to, as you read them, you'll hear people in your life saying things to you. You'll remember things that they've said to you. Because I really do believe that every person, that you're here today because you could have done something else. There are lots of, it's a beautiful day. You could have done all kinds of things, but you're here because you want to grow. And we're here because we love you. We want to help you grow. We want you to be successful. We want your marriages to be the best they've ever been. We want your kids to love you. We want your businesses to be successful. We want your relationships with others to be robust and full of love. And we want you to have friends and extra friends and be happy. And that's what we pray for you. And that's what we want for you. That's why we're doing this series. It all begins with self-awareness. So why don't we take a moment right now and stop and pray and commit ourselves to God that we'll cooperate with the process. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you that really the only truly self-aware person in the room is you and you're God and we're not Lord there are limitations in our lives that are there just because we don't know we need to grow up maybe people have told us maybe we rejected it I don't know but Lord here we are today we're opening our lives to you Holy Spirit we're inviting you to come in and show us where we need to grow we want to be spiritual. We want to be physically healthy as well, but we also want to be emotionally healthy. We don't want to be stunted or stuck. So Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Could you keep your head bowed for one more moment, for one more prayer? Earlier in the message, really toward the end, I said, God the Father sends the Holy Spirit to convict our hearts with the law of God. We know we've sinned. We know we're not right with God. Maybe you're in that place right now. Maybe this is the first time you've ever been here or maybe you've been here a hundred times. But you know when you're nowhere that you're not right with God. So Michael, are you going to embarrass me? I'm not. We don't embarrass people. I'm not going to ask you to leave your seat. I'm not going to ask you to say your name. But if you're here today and you say, I'm not right with God. I know that I know that I'm not right with God and I want to be right. Michael, what do I do? You repent and you trust. Well, great. How do I do that? 
30 seconds from now, I'm going to pray a prayer out loud. All of us are going to pray together. And if you want to be included in that that prayer, you say, Michael, lead me down the path on how to trust him, on how to repent. I'm going to include that in that prayer. Say, I want to be, include Michael, include me in that prayer. I want to be right with God when I leave here today. And that's you. Just slip your hand up. That's as hard as it gets. I'll see your hand. Thank you over here. I'll include you in that prayer. Thank you here. Great. And back over here and over here too. Thank you. Right back here. Appreciate that. Right over here. Would you do me a favor? Keep your hands up long enough for a host team to make their way to you. They're putting a gift in people's hands right now. Thank you here and here and here. And right over here. Thank you. Excellent. Right back here in the corner. Appreciate that. Right up here. Right over there. So if you just keep your hand up long enough for a host team to, to put this gift in your hand, it's a, it's a card, it's a, excuse me, it's a CD, it's six minutes long. It's got five key elements about your relationship with God. Please do listen to it in your car on the way home, as a matter of fact. And it's also include, includes in, in, in that is included your first step. What's the first thing you should do? Some music on it. If you'll also take the little white card that's on that CD and pull it off and take the pin that's there in the back seat pocket and seat back pocket and fill out that little card, leave it on your seat. Later, we'll contact you to see if we can serve you. If you have any questions or um, you want prayer or you need a Bible, we won't hassle you. That's not what we do. We're we're here to help. So anybody else want to get in on this prayer that has not raised their hand, say, Michael, I want to raise my hand now. I want to be right with God. Please help me. Please lead me down that path in prayer. Yeah, right here. Great. Just keep it up there so our host team will make their way to you. Anybody else besides these others that have raised their hand? Awesome. Okay, great. Out loud together. Everybody ready? Say, Jesus, thank you for that cross where you died for my sins. Now, I admit I've sinned against you. That's wrong. And I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And I trust that your work on that cross is enough for me to be forgiven both now and forever. I trust you. I believe in you, and from this moment forward, I'm going to follow you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give a hand to those who raise their hands. God bless you. Best decision you ever made in your life.